Welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz, a podcast where small business owners are celebrated as the backbone of the American economy. Each week, we introduce you to tycoons who share their stories and advice so that small business owners may learn from their experiences. Tycoons is powered by Backbone Planning Partners, Fintrepid Solutions, and Pivotal Advisors. Join us now as our hosts connect you to today's tycoons. Good afternoon, tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host here, as always, Austin Peterson, coming to you live from our brand new studios in Tempe, Arizona. Maybe not exactly brand new for Business Radio X, but for me, it's the first time in studio. These lights make me feel like I'm actually sitting on a camera, you know, like on a a news set, for example, which is pretty awesome. But if you're listening to our podcast for the first time today and you're wondering what it is we do here at Tycoons of Small Biz, we are a small business program put together by small business owners for small business owners. And we essentially interview a new business owner every single week and let them tell their story, talk about their successes, talk about their failures, because we believe that the backbone of the American economy is the small business owner. And we wanted to give them a platform and an opportunity to share their stories and and uh, obviously provide them some content that they can use later on. So with that being said, we uh, we definitely have a tycoon on the on the podcast with us today. I also have one of my co-hosts, probably the best looking co-host that I have, Ryan Weissmuller on the on the phone or excuse me, on the podcast with us today from Fintrepid Solutions. Ryan, welcome to the program. Thank you, Austin. Appreciate the very kind introduction. Good to be good to be back with you again, and, and excited to hear from Franco today. Yeah, it, it's it's easy for me as a bald man to just assume that everybody that has a full head of hair is better looking than me. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> My wife might be the only person on the planet who disagrees with that. Who knows? But I'll tell you what. With uh, with our guest today, uh, Franco Alberon of Alberon Architecture and Construction. Franco is uh, he's got a great story. We did a prequel call with him. We always do with all of our guests, and uh, I was impressed with everything that he's put together and and his background and his story. So I won't steal your thunder, Franco. But uh, welcome to the show, and and uh, we're looking forward to this. Thank you very much for having me. I uh, look forward to uh, being on the show. Yeah. So Franco, before we jump into the business side of things and what you've built, uh, you know, there in Texas. We typically have our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. So, you know, where did they grow up? What did they, you know, did they study something in school? Did they go to college? Are they married? Do they have kids? Whatever you'd like to to share about that, we'd we'd love to hear it. Sure. Uh, Well, thanks again for letting me be on the show. My name is Franco Albron, owner of Albron Architecture and Construction. Um, So I grew up in Rosenberg, Texas, which is about 30 miles southwest of Houston, Texas. Uh, I am married 18 years this past summer. Uh, No kids. From a lot of my friends that tell me they have kids, they say, hey, you dodged a bullet. Uh, (laughs) But uh, (laughs) we have a large family. I'm the youngest of 10 kids. So when we got married, my wife and I, my father and my mom were both like, hey, regarding grandkids, we're we're good. Uh, There's plenty of grandkids for everyone. Um, but no, um, and so we've been married again 18 years, uh, live in Houston. I was originally born in Mexico City, and my parents immigrated here when I was about two years old. My father had already been here for a while, and when I was about two, he brought the whole family over. So uh, we're a first-generation family, and, uh, you know, that was uh, it was a good experience, unique, uh, different. And we grew up really in part of uh, Texas, a little more remote from Houston. So my father wanted to live somewhere kind of more open. Uh, so our house was one of the last houses on the block. And you could actually see some horses and some pasture beyond. Um, so coming from Mexico City, it was a complete different environment for him, which is what drew him to that area. Very cool. So you have to tell me more about this kids thing. I've, I've never heard of somebody coming from a family of 10 kids and then not having any of their own. Even if there were fertility issues, they figured out you know, adopting all those sorts of things. So that that intrigues me. But before you answer that, tell me where you fall in in terms of within those 10 kids. I'm the youngest of, of 10. Okay. So, yeah. And that was part of my reasoning for not having any kids. I saw how the other nine treated the youngest one. Uh, so I decided it would be best to not have any children. So how many total grandkids are we talking, Franco? Oh, you know what? Uh, you're going to get me to lie, but I'm, I've got to say it's probably a solid 40 plus. Okay. Yeah. And there's great grandkids and great, great grandkids. So yeah, quite the, quite the family. Wow. Yeah. That, you know, that's rare nowadays, right? Cause mm-hmm. people, people are getting married later in life, having kids later in life. And so I happen to be one of the lucky 
people in my generation, most of my friends, you know, didn't have this, but I had grand, I had great grandparents that were alive until I was about 20 years old. And so I, I knew them. I spent time at their house probably once a month on a Sunday afternoon, the whole family would get together and we'd have dinner and, you know, play games in the backyard and do those sorts of things. And so I had a relationship with them, but that that's not the case for most, but taking it one step further and having great, great grandkids is, is amazing. Yeah. You know, my father really loved that. Um, he interacted with all of them. Um, you know, he really liked the big family and, you know, from growing up as, as I realized my wife and I, we got married a little bit later in life. Uh, and then we just decided, you know, we're going to focus on our careers. And then when we kind of started thinking about having kids, uh, with a little later in life and we started realizing, you know, we're almost 40 years old. Um, maybe we should probably, uh, consider some other options. And then, uh, when we kind of really thought about it some more, it was just a little late. We figured, ah, you know, we're already kind of set in our ways and we wanted to just uh, continue on uh, in, in the path where we're going right now. Yeah. Nothing wrong with being the best uncle and aunt to, it sounds like a lot of nieces and nephews. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you get to sugar them up and take them back home and say, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So t- tell me a little bit more about what it was like to grow up you were an immigrant as well. You were two years old. You were born in Mexico City. But at two years old, I don't think you really, you know, understand what that's like. But when you get a little bit older, 10, 11, 12, 14 years old, what was that like? And and what did your dad do and your mom do to provide for the family? Um, so growing up, it was uh, it was unique. As you got older, uh, as I got a little bit older, I realized you know, that we are from an immigrant family, obviously. But I think just the interactions we had with other other kids in our area, you know, we were one of the not one of the few, but we were one of the uh, few uh, Mexican families in the area. So our cultures were a little bit different from everybody else. And I remember growing up and just wanting to kind of blend in with everybody else and everybody, all the other kids who went to school. And that was in the way, you know, it could just be maybe the lunches that my mom would prepare versus the lunches that the other kids would eat during lunchtime. And that's when you start figuring out, you know, our, our cultures are different. And my idea or my mom's idea of a sandwich is different than, you know, Billy's mom's idea of a sandwich. And those kinds of things kind of make you aware of that early on. But I think as you get older, uh, you become you kind of embrace that and you accept that and you say, well, you know, this is what makes me unique and different as you kind of move forward in life. Uh, and then growing up in Houston, it's just very diverse. There's a lot of cultures here. And so then when I was able to come to college, University of Houston, I immediately fit, kind of felt like I fit right in with everybody. Uh, and there was so much diversity. And all of a sudden it was like, OK, I'm not the only one. There's, you know, probably like 20 or 30 other nationalities I'm around all the time that have different uh, experiences and different things to offer. Yeah, absolutely. So one last question about that, and then I'll let Ryan jump into the business side of things. But if you had to pinpoint one or two major lessons that you learned growing up as an immigrant in this country that have led you to be successful in your life today, what would you say? Oh, that's definitely going to be work ethic. You know, my father and my mother both had an extremely uh, hard work ethic. You know, my father was a uh, custom jewelry designer and fabricator. He was a third generation. Uh, When he came here, he started working in the jewelry business, eventually started his own shop, his own business, uh, selling custom jewelry and also um, manufacturing it and also repairing it. Uh, and then my mother, she took care of all the kids. Uh, so, but she never stopped. It was 24, seven, seven days a week. And my father was the same thing. He worked all the time. And so we saw that growing up, kind of that, that effort that was put into working hard and being able to provide for your family, but also realizing along the way that, you know, these are the traits that, uh, you know, my father said, look, we're, we're guests in this country. Uh, and as we move forward as a family, you know, we want to become part of this country. And then his idea was working hard and contributing to society in a positive light. Yeah, I think those are great lessons that that many people should learn along the way, immigrant or not, quite honestly, right? I mean, I think work ethic is is something that isn't always taught at home, which is unfortunate, regardless of what you do for a living. Work ethic is huge in, in your kids. And, you know, I think even me, I mean, my kids are 22 and 19. I look back and I think, gosh, did I, did I teach them enough about the importance of work? Did I give them enough life lessons to where, you know, my oldest is, he's going to graduate from college in May and he's going to go out into the world. And you kind of think on one side, you, you know, I joke with him and say, Hey, seven more months, you're going to be off the payroll, right? Or, you know, eight, <laughs> eight more months, you're off the payroll. But the other side of it is, is he ready? right? I mean, did I prepare him enough for that? Did I teach him the importance of work? And is he ready to go out and do whatever it is that he chooses to do 
to make a living in this world, make a difference and make relationships in this world. And, and that's kind of, you know, it's important whether we're immigrants or not to teach our, our kids that. Yeah. You know, I think everybody, I mean, be, I think the kids learn that they pick up on it, you know, from home and also their other kids in their, in their schools and their parents. And, you know, they're around that they're, they're going to feed off of that. And I think today's kids are far more connected and far more aware of, of society and, and things like that. They have so much, so many more platforms, right? Social media. So I think they see a lot of things and it just, they kind of just can, they kind of absorb that. And then, you know, I think moving forward, it, it's great for the kids that, uh, that not only with the parents, but it could be an athlete or an actor or whatnot that they see. And they, you know, it's a great idea. Frankly, your, your story is so fascinating. I'm glad you shared some of that. I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned your father was a third generation jewelry maker. Right. How, how hard was it to, to fight that urge to follow in his footsteps? And then where did that spark? You've been in and around architecture a long time, studied it in college. Where did that spark start? And, and walk us through just when you realized that this was really something you had a passion for, wanted to make a career out of. So my dad in his shop, I got to join him in his shop from time to time. And I got to see the process firsthand. And it was a creative process of making something and then developing that idea and then building it and giving it to your and hand it over to the client. So that idea always intrigued me of designing and fabricating and making. That was just something that I thought to myself, this is what I want to do. And in architecture was is definitely that, but on a on a bigger scale. And I think as a those lessons that I had with my father in the shop, I got to learn about material, gold, silver. They have different properties, diamonds, and all that affects and really influences architecture because brick has a different you know property than concrete, which you can do with concrete with wood, different components. And so then at, at a young age, being able to kind of expose to that and thinking about that, it was for me, it felt like a pretty seamless transition to go to architecture. I will admit that my father was a little disappointed that I picked architecture. When I told him I wanted to study uh, in college, he thought maybe I would study business and then come back and, and kind of grow the, the family business. But I told him, I was like, look, architecture is really what I like. It's, it's what I feel that I want to do. I was in seventh grade and I saw the a picture of falling water from Frank Lloyd Wright, Pennsylvania. And that just spoke to me on a whole different level. And right away, it, I felt that as a kid and I, and I said to myself, I want to do whatever this is. And so then I just spent the next five years figuring out what is that and how can I do that? So that's interesting. You, I mean, I, I didn't think about it, but the parallels, it now makes a ton of sense from watching jewelry being made. Obviously, the, the end product is something different, but, but you know, a, a jewel or a diamond in of itself at the end of the day with what you're creating I, I'm curious, though, because a, a, a lot of people, I mean, we all, I, I think I think one of my dreams as a, as a young kid was I thought I'd be a meteorologist someday and clearly went a very different direction from that. It, something clearly stuck in your mind that you had a very clear vision, very clear path that, that this was fascinating to you. I mean, you mentioned seeing that Frank Lloyd Wright design. What do you think was the secret? I mean, was it just a a firm commitment or and it's just interesting that that literally you you thought ahead and it all essentially went largely according to plan in, in terms of your career path that's that just seems a bit unique how what would you ascribe that to um you know the other thing in that is also is that my my uncle in mexico was an architect um and so that was my mom's brother and i get to, I, I did spend every summer there with my uncle and i did get get to go with him to his office and and be around and be exposed to architecture uh and that was a huge influence as well and that influenced me in a different way in the way that architecture is practiced in mexico versus in the united states over there the the architect is the one that's actually managing the construction kind of managing everything and kind of seeing it through the end here it's a, a bit more kind of separated uh, it can be um but that definitely had an influence in 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 me being an architect and kind of test driving the profession before i got into it in college yeah it's interesting you mentioned that because you're absolutely right here in the here in the states typically architecture and building are separate and you guys do both right which i think about it from from somebody who's looking at it purely from an efficiency standpoint i think my gosh if if an architect truly understood what those plans meant that he or she is drawing right and they they wouldn't think about whatever a closet being in a certain area that ends up being too small or it's too hard to actually get the 2 by 4s framed up in that area or you know whatever it is there are lots of different scenarios where you as a builder and an architect can envision this, but the architects don't, they're not, 
trained typically to think that way. They're, th- they're trained to, how do I make this look aesthetically pleasing, not what's it going to take to actually get it built and how difficult am I making it on the contractor who's responsible to build this? Yeah, you know, I'll say, so unfortunately, I think our profession, heck, we, we, as my ex-boss used to say, we're problem solvers, but we're also problem makers. <laughs> and so that was one of the things I learned early on in my career was how to solve problems. And, you know, that's really what design, it designed what in school, they call it a problem or a project. It's, it's a problem, how you can solve it. And then in practicing as a, as a young intern was very much that, is that we were exposed to different things that would come up uh, during the, the design phase that we had to kind of document in drawings and figure it out, figure out the design. But then there was a whole nother part to figure out, which is when you hand it over to the contractor and then he's got to figure out your design so he can build it so it doesn't leak. And so, you know, there's no air leaking out or anything getting in. And so there's a lot of little components that go into it. And that's where you start scratching your head going like, you know, that's a, you know, I'm asking this guy to do quite a bit of work because he had, he's never seen this design and he's got maybe two months to figure it all out. Hopefully it's going to stand and not leak. And that's a tall order, even for the best contractors out there. Yeah. And can they read it the right way, right? Can they read the plans the way that you intended them when you drew them up? Yeah. You know, and that's, it's exactly it. You know, the other thing is in how we document drawings and, and, and whatnot. It's one of the things that my ex boss taught me was that, you know, we have a thing in drawings that's called line weights, just kind of how you, what you're accentuating. He said, this is a language you're, you're basically speaking to the contract, to the subcontractors who are going to build the, this product in the end. And so a lot of what we do also in our drawings is make sure we, that's very clear, it's understandable so that everybody who sees it, it's like gets it from the first time. They don't have to scratch their head and say, what was the guy thinking of doing here? You know, that's, there's a lot to do there as well. Yeah. Well, and I, I can't believe I, I waited this long to mention this, but I can't let it go by that Ryan wanted to be a meteorologist as a child. <laughs> I mean, tell me that face and that voice yeah. would not a meteorologist make. I mean, Ryan Rains, right? I mean, you can't have a uh, name like Weissmuller to be, <laughs> to be a meteorologist. I, I have heard meteorology in Arizona is quite boring, so it's probably good that I didn't go that route. But. <laughs> well, it'd be easy. You would never be wrong, right? <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, it rains sometimes in the summer mm-hmm. and it's sunny and hot the rest of the time. Pretty much. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Pretty much. All right, Franco. So tell us a little bit about your your leadership style. What do you what do you do that's unique and the and the way that you interact not only as an architect and a build and a builder, but how do you interact with the subcontractors who are ultimately the ones who are for the most part building these structures that you're designing and building? Yeah. So my, my way of, of leadership is kind of getting a uh, very collaborative effort with everyone. Um, when I work with a subcontractor, I tell them, look, this is the end, end result, the end goal. This is what we want this to look like, whether it's a cabinet or tile or whatnot. And then I rely on them and their experience and expertise to tell me what's the best way to, to install this and to do this to, and also be a little bit less maintenance work. Now, that, that works in, in two twofold for us. One, that we get them to kind of get some buy-in where they feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, their their opinion is very much appreciated. And I want them to take some ownership of what they're about to do because they're going to provide, uh, provide a better task. And then the other one is we think through the problem of um, the installation ahead of time. It's the purpose, really the main purpose for that. So we can kind of think through the steps, think of anything that might go wrong. If it does go wrong, what can we do? Kind of some contingencies. So that therefore, before they get into it, they're telling me all of these things that could, you know, that they need to do this, that, and the other. And then once it's laid out, then it's just a matter of, okay, we've agreed on this. Let's go ahead and move forward. And then it tends to be a better seamless installation and a little bit more efficient, which is the whole purpose of doing the, uh, that process. But So let me ask you if, to take that a step further or, or ask you if you do take that a step further. Do you do actual design meetings with all of your subcontractors in the same room with you? We do pre-construction meetings. I meet with them individually. Only this like coordination between electrical, plumbing, or HVAC that we then meet with those subcontractors as a group. Uh, but for the most part, I meet with all my subcontractors ahead of time, uh, before definitely before they get there. Usually about thirty days out, you know, I'll walk the job with them. And we we go through one more time. It's okay. What do you need from me? And what is the the, the previous trade need to do? Have ready for you to come in and do your job efficiently and effectively. Because the last thing I want to do is have my plumber show up and say, hey, I need this, that, or that. Or can you guys provide these items? Or can you move this out of the way? We like to know ahead of time. So when they show up, they're efficient and they're happy. Uh, and then they're the only ones on the job for the most part. We try not to put too many people on top of each other. 
because it just slows down everybody. And that's when accidents happen. Uh, so we're really a big proponents about letting every subcontractor in there kind of have the space for their own and actually do what they need to do and be very more other, uh, much more efficient in that manner. Yeah. Frank, I'm, I'm, I'm curious with the, with the process, which, which mm-hmm. you mentioned and you and Austin were talking is, is, is unique in your industry. So, you know, a, a lot of folks out there, and I'm sure even, even folks that are contractors have a perspective of what an architect is and does. You're, you're breaking the mold on that a little bit. How, how have you found just getting some traction around that again, amongst the contractors, not even talking about your customers yet, but was, was it warmly received? Were there some barriers that you had to overcome? I, I'm, I'm sure it took time. Um, what, what was that experience like? Yeah, it took some time. I will say once I became more of a contractor builder, one of the things that I did was I called all the previous contractor builders I worked with and I apologized for giving them uh, some very complicated designs. <laughs> uh, and I said, sorry, I made your life uh, kind of kind of difficult there um, because now we're in their role, we're in their shoes. But I think in terms of the subcontractors and the other contracts we work with, they, they received it well. I mean, they for them, it's like, hey, I no longer have to call the contractor, then call the architect to come out here and look at something. Now they call me and I'm able to go there immediately. And I'm, we're the ones that designed it. We documented it. We're the process of building it. And so who better to know exactly what your intention is in the architect? And that's the reason we started the business is that we wanted, we started seeing in the in our business and our projects when we weren't involved, that there was these little slip, you know, hiccups and little things that would go wrong, miscommunication. And we wanted to kind of close that gap completely and then just make it more seamless. And at the end of the day, it's the best thing for the client and for the project. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, the reason I asked the question about having them in the same room and you you alluded to this, I mean, the reality is that, you know, not every subcontractor does things the way that the subcontractor that comes after them would like them to be done, right? And the other benefit of being in the same room is so you can ask each other, right? So how do you like this? What can I do here to make your job easier? But the other thing that it does from time to time is it it actually allows them to all be on the same page and understand that the next guy is relying on me to show up on time to get my job done on time, keep everybody on schedule. And they realize that they're not just working independently, but they are truly working as a team to build this structure as quickly and efficiently as possible. Absolutely. And, you know, we use the same subcontractors on every project. So there is a lot of overlap. And a lot of times we try to schedule a little bit of overlap, like when one is finishing up, the other one's coming in and they can see things ahead of time. Uh, I can definitely tell you that my framer and my plumber, they're very close uh, and they always communicate with one another. And the framer will always call the plumber and say, hey man, last time you were out here, we we did this for you and and you can let it run in another way, your your vent. Uh, Let us know next time that's how you want to do it and we'll we'll accommodate that because it's actually, we got to come back and do some rework. And I tell them like, look, let's have an open conversation because at the end of the day, I want the best quality product we can deliver and I also want to make sure everybody's efficient in what we're doing, uh, but they're all proud. And, you know, because at the end of the day, we also have to warranty this product. And so then that's how we're able to get the contractors to kind of uh, buy in and also create that kind of that team, uh, that team mentality. Let's take a quick break. We're going to hear a quick call to action for our listeners. And then we'll come back and we'll explore a little bit more about uh, Franco Alberon and, and uh, his company, Alberon Architecture and Building. Hey there, Tycoons. Austin Peterson here, co-host of Tycoons of Small Biz. If you think you have what it takes to be considered a tycoon and you're wondering how you could become a featured guest, please follow and then message us at Tycoons of Small Biz on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if it is a mutually good fit. And if so, we'll get you scheduled for an interview. If you're unsure about being a guest on our podcast, but are contemplating selling your business over the next few years and you'd like to know what your business is worth, Please also follow us and then message us on LinkedIn for your no obligation, informal valuation of your business. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening to the Tycoons of Small Biz podcast. And now back to today's program. All right, Tycoons, welcome back. We're here with Franco Alberon and I said it wrong before the break, but uh, Alberon Architecture and Construction. I said building, same thing, but not uh, the actual name of (laughs) of the company. I apologize, Franco. Before we jump back into the business side, I'm going to let Ryan ask another question or two about uh, about the business. But it it dawned on me that you know you you were you were talking about your dad not being 
super happy that you didn't go into the jewelry business or didn't study business so that you could take over the business. But my mind goes to, well, what about the other nine siblings that were older than Franco, right? Like, <laughs> w- where were they? And and where did, you know, why was the pressure still on Franco at that point? You know, that is, all of them uh, are independent on their own. I say probably about four of them in, in, in the actual jewelry business. The other the other ones mm-hmm. are married. But, you know, it was, uh, my all my brothers have their own shop, so to speak. Uh, they do different components. Some do more kind of uh, full service jewelry. Some just do diamond settings. Some do what they call casting, which is kind of manufacturing of, of, of rings and other components. Uh, so there's different forms of it. And they all kind of work together and they collaborate with one another to, you know, on different things. You know, they already had started their own business. And my dad, I think I was the youngest one. And so he figured, he, you know, you're going to step up and do this. You know, he was happy that I went to college. Uh, he was, you know, I'm grateful to you know, give me that opportunity. And I did want to study business, but really it was just the architecture part. And I told him that, look, I got the idea from designing and making from you. I just want to do it on a, on a different scale. That's interesting. That just, that just, you know, that hit me. I thought, well, wait a minute. There were nine other siblings. Why, <laughs> why was Franco feeling the pressure? <laughs> so, Franco, when did that pressure start relieving a bit? I mean, uh, was it was it when you were out on your own? Were there still some skepticism? I mean, when when could you really sit back and say you felt like you had um, maybe approval is the wrong word, but but had their full blessing with what you were doing and that it actually was the right choice? Uh, definitely, I think when I started uh, architecture school, they uh, that I'd say that that you know not the pressure, but definitely they, they were all just happy that I was going to one go to college and, and wanted to study something higher education. So I think for me, the minute I got in architecture school, the first weekend, uh, we had some pretty abstract projects uh, that we're working on. But I remember thinking, this is what this is what I need to be doing. This is what I want to be doing. And I just, I never looked back after that. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And it was a, a great experience. I don't know that I want to go back to the to the five-year program at the University of Houston, because it's pretty grueling, but it's it was fun. I'm curious a little bit of a history lesson because we'd be remiss right now if we didn't at least, you know, we're, we're talking to a lot of the tycoons out there about just how some of the uncertainty in the markets right now is affecting their business. And you've you've been in this space a long time. You've seen a number of cycles. What are you seeing right now from your purview and, and what's your own outlook for your, for your business and the industry you serve just in the midst of, of some of this uncertainty? For us, it's kind of all over the place. Sometimes we feel like it's going to maybe turn, maybe slow down, and then it kind of picks up again. But I vote one thing is a constant is that this business is either feast or famine. We either have a lot of work or there's really not a whole lot going on. And trying to find that that sweet spot has been very difficult, and which is what we try to do very uh, often in, in terms of our business and how we do things by limiting the amount of work that we take on. But I think, you know, overall, the business is picking up. I think construction is still very healthy, especially custom residential, which is what we do. Uh, material prices are not really coming down. They're not going up. They're stabilizing. So I think it gives some, you know, a little more certainty to people. Uh, but also remodelings have really picked up quite a bit because now it's like instead of, you know, going out and building a you know, brand new house, maybe I'll just remodel the one I'm in now and say, stay in it 10 more years and see what's going to happen next. So that, that component is uh, pretty healthy as well. In terms of our business, feeling confident moving forward that everything's where it needs to be and maybe it might not be as busy as we would want it to be moving forward. It is busy, but you know, at the same time, we also welcome the opportunity to kind of be able to work on some projects that we really get into the details. You, you brought up the feast or famine nature and, yeah. and something certainly a lot of entrepreneurs have to deal with. Certainly, it sounds like you want to be able to do it better, but I mean, you've had some sustainability. You've, you've, you've been around on your own for, I think, over for 15 years now, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. What, what has worked that you might share with an entrepreneur out there who's just getting started themselves on how to manage that when, again, I mean, you're, you're providing a service. So that feast or famine impact, you feel that. What's what's worked for you that you might share as a best practice or two? I think just being conservative with your cash flow uh, more than anything. We do a lot of, we're very conservative. I am. For the most part, we don't like to go out and kind of overextend ourselves and get over leveraged and whatnot. We really believe in looking maybe two months, three months down the, down the line, kind of understanding where we need to be with our projections and, and, our, and our cash flow. But also, Overall, just being conservative and as a business in terms of how you grow and not taking on too much work and, and then trying to, you know, 
uh, service different components that maybe you're not really good at doing or you haven't really gotten into, you need to learn more. We do a lot of research on what we're about to embark on and make sure we, hey, can we provide the service? If we can, how do we do it? Uh, what's the best way that we can do it? And then one of the quotes that I, that I read many, many years ago and just stuck with me was, know what you do well and perfect it. And that is something that I stick to every day. I know exactly what, we're, what we do well. If we're going to do something outside of our normal scope, then we research it before we get involved. But that is, I think that alone will always bring in the work that you're looking for. It may not come in the time you want it, but it'll it'll be there. And it's just kind of trusting that process that if you put all your systems in place, then it, it's going to work out. I love the two things you said there. Austin and I have the pleasure of working with a lot of different entrepreneurs. And when times are good, you know, it, it can be easy to, to chase a little bit and, and to maybe deviate just a little bit from that sweet spot because there's more opportunity. And, and also something we see all the time is, Growth, growth takes capital. So yeah. watching that cash flow very, very carefully because there's businesses that are growing that don't have cash. And, and you know, you just said it, that's what's kept you out of some trouble. Those are two really, really vital lessons. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely after 2008 with the housing crisis, I think we all learned that pretty quick because people, even individuals who you would say on paper, or it's easy for them to have access to capital, didn't have access to capital. And then all of a sudden you're going, wait a minute, this might be something that we need to, you know, kind of dig into a little bit more. Yeah, it's funny. When 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 you started talking about forecasting cash flow, I saw that special Ryan glimmer in his eye, you know, because he loves a business owner that will forecast cash flow into the future. But it is, it is absolutely crucial. We've talked about this on the program. Ryan and I have talked about it individually. We talk about it with our with our business owners that we work with, you know, professionally. It, it is, it's missed. Most business owners don't do it. Most business owners don't fully understand it. We don't understand the importance of cash flow overall. I mean, the reality is whether you have a million dollar revenue business or you have a hundred million dollar revenue business, the biggest thing that causes a business to fail is cash flow. And if yep. you don't, if you don't know it, if you don't know your numbers and you don't know where you're going to get access to capital in the future, if it's needed, whether it's reserves or your line of credit or whatever it is in, in that instance, your business could be gone in the blink of an eye, even a hundred million dollar a year revenue business. Oh, absolutely. I like what you just said right now. Know your numbers. You know, that's a you know, so for example, you know, professional golfers know exactly how far how far they hit every club in their bag. So if that's their concept, that we should, as business owners should know how much money we need on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, yearly basis to to function and stay afloat. If you don't, in my opinion, if you don't know those, you need, you need to really kind of get the vitals on those because it's, that's key to, to sustaining, you know, a two month or a, a one month slowdown in the market. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I, I, you mentioned that, you know, I think you said something like we learned this in the 2008, you know, crash and, and, and companies <laughs> that you didn't expect to have problems. But the reality is I don't think that everybody learned it, Right. The farther the pain gets away in your memory, the more you forget about it, right? I mean, yesterday was Labor Day. I took the, t- took the day off. My wife and I and, and uh, my son and his girlfriend, we went uh, kayaking and paddleboarding at a lake that's, that's close to us, right? And it's, it's interesting to go up there and I, you know, my mind works this way, but I'm watching these big trucks and really expensive boats, you know, pull up in, into the marina and almost exclusively were they a tradesman, right? So it's, it's a roofing company. It's, you know, general contractors, it's tile company, it's floor, you know, whatever it is, almost exclusively, those were the businesses. And me knowing what I know and doing what I've done for the last 20 years, and Ryan would be the same way and, and you would be the same way. We know that that's not indicative of how much money they make or how successful their business is. That's really indicative of do they understand the importance of cash flow and are they leveraged yeah. <laughs> to the hilt, right? And it's more than likely that they're leveraged. Yeah. How lot of those yeah. boats were paid for in cash? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. You know, and, and, and to that, I'm probably one of the only contractors in, in town, probably in the U.S., that doesn't have a pickup truck. You know, I have a Honda Accord. Um, <laughs> the way I look at it, everything's delivered to the job site anyway. So why do I need to, you know, have a, a big truck? Yeah, no, I think I think that speaks to who you are as a, as an individual, and and 
you know, some of that might be growing up as an immigrant, you know, as in the family. Yeah, of immigrants, definitely. Right. Yeah, my father, I mean, you know, as an entrepreneur himself and in, in opening jewelry stores, you know, he we felt that as as kids. You know, he never said anything, but you know, we knew when times were great, we knew when times were tough. And seeing what my what my parents uh had to do, uh, in terms of just providing for the family, def- definitely makes you uh, you know, kind of take a, a step back and say, Okay, so I made X amount of dollars, but you know, how much of that do I want to do I want to part with on, on this? And so then you start kind of equating and you start valuing your money a little bit differently. It's no longer it costs me, you know, a hundred bucks for sneakers. It's what it's maybe a half hour of my time, an hour or a week, you know, whatever it is, you start looking at how much time do I have to work to then make that money. And that's where, you know, that's where the value part comes in. Yeah, no, no doubt. So that actually leads me to, to another question. So there's this balance, right, of security and risk, right? So right. growing up as an immigrant, sometimes you're, you're very focused on security, but at the same time, many immigrant families in our country take that risk to go out and build their own business and take full control of, you know, what it is that they're going to build and how they're going to provide for their family. So how did you reconcile that yourself in making that leap of, I'm not going to work for somebody else. I'm going to start my own business. You know, I think for me, uh, growing up, everybody in my family was either had their own business or was looking to start their own business. So I just kind of saw it as a, as the next step, the next progression to, 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 to work on. When I initially started out, I thought maybe, you know, I want to aspire to be kind of a partner in the firm and kind of, you know, in a bigger component like that. As I practiced, though, I realized and I got comfortable with who I am in terms of my personality, in terms of uh, how I work. I'm very laid back. I'm not big for the big corporate you know, firms. I'm pretty laid back to my clients. I think that's one of the reasons they, they enjoy working with us is because all of us are pretty easy going laid back, but we're going to provide one great value and great service. And then as I practiced, I realized there was nothing out there that really kind of interests me in terms of where I wanted to work. So I decided, you know what, hang your own shingle, go out there, see how it goes. Um, and I just got started in architecture. I started that and it went well. And then eventually over time, I, I started seeing this gap in the market. I said, you know what? I want to close this gap on my end. So I added another layer, which was building. And I'm very risk adverse. And building is very much is a huge risk in that in the, you're doing. A, not only a financial risk, because you you basically do the work and then they're, they're, the bank or your client's going to pay you back. So there's that, that aspect of the risk. But then the other risk is I have to warranty this for two, three, 10 years structurally. So then, you, you know, there's a lot of that goes into it, but then that's when you believe in yourself and you start believing in, in your abilities and the people around you, you hire good people to work with you. And that's how we move forward. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to look at it. You know, it, what I hear really is, one, it was kind of ingrained in me. All my family is entrepreneurs that I just felt like that was the way that it was going to go. Two, I don't see myself as a corporate guy. I don't know that I could handle that. But, but three, it's, Yes, there's risk, but I understand that risk and I'm doing what I need to behind the scenes to protect myself from that risk. Correct. And the other thing was, if it didn't work out for whatever reason, I could always go and work somewhere. So it's not like I would find myself completely unemployed. I always had that in the back of my my head, but I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to practice architecture in a different way kind of the way we do it now, which is design and construction, that didn't exist out there. And so if I wanted to do that, I had to go create that space for myself and for my team to, to allow us to do that because no one else wanted to really do that because architects, to a certain extent, were risk adverse. Uh, we don't want to step into that. That's why it's kind of the delineation between who designs and who builds. But I just kind of felt like this is the way we want to get involved and this is what we want to do. And it's a lot of fun. We really do enjoy it. So you, you saw that opportunity, Franco, and I was, I was going to tack on to at what Austin said, because it, it did seem like you saw that very early on, that there was an opportunity to fill a void to really put a couple things together and, and do this all more efficiently. What's, what's the next evolution, if there is one? I mean, what does is, what is Alboron architecture and, and design look like 15 years from now, 5, 10? Um, where do you see it going from here? Sounds so- like you're far from done. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> I think the the thing is uh, getting complacent. Uh, we don't like that. 
But more importantly, we we want to become more full service. And by that, I mean, is there a component that we could add into our business, whether it's uh, real estate, you know, being able to kind of be your full service for finding that lot for you, helping you close on that lot, moving that process forward. There's a lot of components that go into that, especially if you have a big piece of property and you need to replat it. Uh, the other thing is interior design. Can we start doing some of that more in-house? So it's kind of looking at it as a, as a whole umbrella in terms of everything falling underneath what we already do to provide that that level of service, efficiency, but also, you know, it's very personalized service that we give our clients, very curated to them and their project, and no two projects are alike. And so it's how do we grow that without actually kind of growing the business in the sense of taking on more work is can, can we expand our services that we provide already? So you've, you've found this unique intersection where you've been able to, to create an experience that sounds like is much more efficient for the customer, but also more efficient. In, and again, when you get your partners in the right alignment, more efficient on the back end as well. So you've, you've struck a little bit of a, of a perfect mix here, if I'm, if I'm hearing all this correctly. It's a great way to do it uh, because it's all in, internal in terms of we don't have to coordinate with a lot of other individuals. I'm just someone of the opinion that, you know, one, we don't, we like efficiency as much as we can. And at the end of the day, it's, I want to make sure that the clients have that experience and that service that they're looking for. This is a huge investment they're about to make, whether it's remodeling or building a new home. And we wanted an experience that was going to match that, that, uh, that investment in terms of what, you know, one, it's what's the problem, so to speak.